It's a dry Sunday morning. You grab your morning coffee and scoot your rapidly growing kitten off your office chair and despite her protest, sit down at your desk to check your email. A new message pops up in your inbox almost as soon as you do. It's from Amanda and you remember your meeting in the cafe and awkwardly bringing up your feelings to her for like two hours in the car. Subject. Hey, buddy. Hey, sorry, it's been a few weeks. I meant to get this to you sooner, but it took a while for me to get a hold of my folks back home. Dad told me to say hi, by the way. Hmm. Anyway, I remember that we talked about... I remember what we talked about last time I saw you and I hope you aren't insulted but I asked my mom for the number for her therapist. Don't worry, I didn't tell her who it was for. I think she's worried about me now though, haha. -ha. Anyway, the number is whatever, it's, really, it's a really good office, you should look into it. Talking to someone never hurts. Okay, so she's one step above minimum wage she can't afford a fucking therapist you dig? she can't go because she can't pay for it thank you Obama fuck you America talking to someone and it hurts if you're worried about money don't be they're one of the few that has a really good Sliding scale fee system and won't charge you what you can't afford. Okay. Well, there you go. Thank you, Obama. I hope you're feeling better. It was really nice to see you again. Hey, it's still early enough that you could go and make an appointment today. Your kitten curls up in your lap as you consider what to do. Close the email without thinking more of it. This has been embarrassing enough already. Okay, option number one is call the therapist's number. You're looking forward to the help you think they can offer. Try to look and call them. Try your luck and call the number. So, okay, we'll sleep on it. The thought of picking up the phone and calling someone about this right now is overwhelming. Everything is overwhelming. Sure, you're having a hard time lately, have motivation issues, but are you really in need of therapy? Well, Okay, I you really need a therapy. If, if, if you think that maybe you're in need of therapy, you should go see the therapist and then he's gonna tell you if you are really in need of therapy. Shouldn't you be able to just get over it yourself? Well, maybe you should be. What if they put you on medication that makes you feel like a zombie? What if you go and the therapist looks down on you? What will Alex think about this? Try to think about all these things at once makes you feel like a very big makes it feel like a very big deal and you decide to take your time to think on it. The rest of the day passes quickly and that night you have a hard time trying to sleep because your brain is too busy thinking about all these things and imagining all of the ways it could go horribly wrong. The next morning you check your email again with blurry eye sand and mewing kitten. Amanda's email is still there. So where do you expect it to go? Seemingly waiting for you. You are no more decided than you were yesterday. What now? Don't call, this is way too much for you to be able to deal with right now. Call after wrestling with it for a few minutes longer.
to the huge tremendous email two or three times then sit and stare at your computer for a while while the memory of that uncomfortable conversation makes you feel newly embarrassed and self-conscious part of you is also encouraged by the fact that she cared enough to get back to you at all Sitting in front of your computer, you start to question things like whether or not Amanda sent you this sent you this number out of pity, or perhaps some sense of sense of obligation after having listened to you. You question her motives and the validity, her concern, and what and whether or not you think seeing a therapist would even be helpful. Everybody can be helped by a therapist, even if you're not sick, you know, even if you're not debilitated by depression or whatever. Seeing a therapist is, you know, the guy is a, or the woman, who knows, whatever. It's a trained professional. So he knows how to make you feel better. Uh, to make you confront your issues so if even if you're not stressing out gnashing your teeth sleeping all the time going to see a therapist just to check on you is never a bad idea that almost unconsciously you reach for your phone and before you realize what's happening you're listening to a therapist's line ring before you can bring yourself to hang up you're listening to the slightly Clinical but not unblazing voice of the receptionist ask how she can help you uh, I'd like to make an appointment with the the doctor you manage to stammer out the conversation is quick and not nearly as unpleasant as you were feeling and quicker than you can say Freudian slip well you scheduled an appointment Quicker than you realize, appointment day rolls around. What do you do? What's the difference between go to the therapist's office, head to the therapist's office, even though you're totally unsure of what to expect? You have a car? You didn't have a car before? Finally, you have your first session with your new therapist, Dr. Susan Melva, because of course it's a woman. A tall woman in her mid-forties with a disarming demeanor and patient eyes with the start of the slightest smile lines. She makes you feel comfortable fairly easy, which is a pleasant surprise after all of your anxiety over the appointment. As you leave, you make a second appointment, you're, re you're still skeptical about all, all of this, but figure you might as well see where this goes. The hardest part, it seems, was taking the first step. You're still not sure if and how you're going to tell your family or your partner, but you, you don't have to tell them shit. You have to tell them if the therapist tells you that you're some sort of suicide risk so then you have to warn them otherwise it's none of their concern it's therapy, it's not AIDS you're having some mental issues, not a you know, AIDS where were we? you're still not sure if if and how you're going to tell your family or your partner. But you figure you deal with that when the time comes. Either way, you feel relieved that you managed to see this through instead of being paralyzed with worry over it. Even if nothing comes of it, 
You did something you said you would instead of flaking out or running away, which is a good habit. You're emotionally exhausted when you get home and collapse into bed. You sleep better that night than you have than you have in a week. And you're not sure if it's because you were so tired when you got home or if it's because of the therapist. Therapist. You're very depressed. You spend a large amount of time sleeping, hating yourself and have very little energy or motivation. You spend some time in on a therapist's couch, you're having difficulty finding the motivation to continue going to your sessions. You're not currently taking medication for depression, which maybe you don't need. It is early on Wednesday morning. Lately you've developed a nasty habit of waking up 10-20 minutes before your alarm rings. How is that a nasty habit? You've the You've developed a nasty habit of waking up 10 to 20 minutes before your alarm rings. This isn't a nasty habit. Waking up in the morning is not a nasty habit. And unfortunately, today is no exception. You lay in bed each minute ticking closer and closer to wake up time. And why don't you just get out of bed when you actually do wake up? And passing on a swelling wave of ever encroaching dread. Sooner than you would like your alarm blurs and caustic inevitability, you frantically pump the button and then retreat under the black ah. ah, there you go. As if the warmth of your comf comforter can shield you from the passage of time. You almost always have difficulty rising from bed, but today that simple task seems nothing short of Herculean. After several snow cycles, you decide that you just can't deal with work today. You're incapable of even rousing yourself from bed, let alone going into work and having to force yourself through a work day. Not to mention you've snoozed so many times that it would be impossible to make it in on time now. Anyways, what do you do? Heading to work, you lazy bitch. In spite of the fact that your body is actively fighting you, literally every step of the way, you somehow manage to drag yourself out of bed and make your way into work. You somehow manage. Fuck you. Surprisingly, you end up only being about five minutes late and nobody seems to notice or care because nobody does. Though when you woke up, the simple act of being even physically present at your job seemed like an impossibility. You are surprised at your own ability to push on through the day like everybody else. While you are far from enjoying the job, you are not supposed to be enjoying it. <laughs> or indeed even really coping with the dullness of your job today. You seem to have slipped into a trance-like state of automation and time is nevertheless passing. Eventually the end of the day rolls around and you head home, utterly exhausted but at the same time almost proud of yourself for having stuck it out. It's 2 a.m. on a Sunday and you have work in the morning. You roll over and see the sickly green glow of the time displayed on your little alarm clock and let out an exasper exasperated sigh. You've been trying to fall asleep for over three hours now to no avail. Every time you, your head hits the pillow, you're overcome with anxious thoughts that wrap themselves around each other. Worries about your job lead to worries about your future, lead to worries about your very identity and you're unable to shake them off long enough to doze off. Your eyes won't even stay shut as your mind races through imagined scenarios going horribly wrong which you promptly attribute to your general worthlessness.
Ah, you, your thoughts run too fast for you to come to a satisfying conclusion on any of them. Your room is completely silent, but the silence has given way to a loud static noise running around inside your head. Your heart beats loudly and your worry is being a little too fast. You worry that if you focus too strongly on your racing heart, you freak yourself out hard enough that you have a heart attack. You have to be awake for work in mere 8 hours. 8 hours? It was 2 a.m.? 8 hours. You have to be awake for work. From 2 o'clock, you go to work at 10 o'clock, you lazy no, you have to be awake at 10. But what time do you go to work? And you know that your work is so much worse on only a few hours sleep. What do you do? Well, I have the same problem. I can't get to sleep. Yeah, at about 2 o'clock. I manage. I often manage. I'm late for work every day. Uh, I asked the doctor about this and he said that my sleeping schedule gets knocked off by staying awake. So what I need to do is not go to bed at all, you know, not even lay down on the bed the whole night go to work in the morning, go through the whole day without it, having slept at all, and then in the evening, you just go to bed early. You know, you go really early. Like, let's say you go to bed at 9. And you sleep for like 10, 11 hours. And you wake up early because you have already slept as much as you need. So you can wake up early. And that's how you fix this sleeping issue. So, option six is what my doctor told me when I went to him for my sleeping problems. So, I don't know if this is supposed to be a bad option here, but... Sometimes just sleep isn't happening. It's not. This is not something you just attribute to depression, which is why I've been mad at this game this whole time. Because these are normal things that aren't necessarily directly, you know, result of depression. As is this one, you know. So we do what the doctor said. You get out of bed and head to your desk. Laying in bed with nothing but your thoughts to keep you company makes you feel like you're going insane. The harshness of the light coming from the screen makes you squint as you turn it on. Despite how often you find yourself in this exact situation, there have been so many nights lately just like this. As you begin reading a new story, an online friend of yours instant messages you. Attic, you're up late again, I see. Yeah, can't sleep again. Thinking too much again. Thinking, you guessed it. Wanna talk about it? You end, up, you end up talking with Attic for quite some time about how you've been feeling. He's always been easy to talk to about personal matters. And the added security of talking online helps being able to rethink what you say as you type it out and check it before... You send it out, helps you gather your thoughts. Uh, and you find it less intimidating in a way to type it all into a prompt than say it out loud. I want to be that guy who thinks they can diagnose something because I read a Wikipedia article, but it kind of sounds like you might have depression. No, it doesn't! You're having some work issues, you're having some age issues because you're not a kid anymore and you're... Uh, who am I fucking talking to you? 
it kind of sounds like you might have depression is wrong it just it doesn't Uh, you should talk to someone about that, like a doctor. You pause, are you really that transparent, or is it that you've gotten used to talking about your feelings at this point? Yes, I... Yes. Your insomnia makes you a little paranoid, but you shake it off. We can do some research and see if there's a good doctor near you. It's not like you're going back to sleep anytime soon anyway. You might as well do something while you're awake. No, that's okay. Actually, I have talked to someone about it. Of course. Oh, okay. I'm glad you're taking that step. I've heard it's not an easy one. I know people kind of suck at understanding this sort of stuff. So. Fuck you. I'm looking at the picture. Fuck the picture. I know people kind of suck at understanding this sort of stuff sometimes, but there's nothing wrong with having the there's nothing wrong with having depression. There is nothing wrong with having depression, but if you're having depression, you're sick. It's not a character trait. You know, you're not just quirky that way. Having depression. Oh, you know him, he's having depression. There's nothing wrong with being a moody bastard, you know. There's nothing wrong with slightly being cunty. There is something wrong with having depression. Because you're basically, you're sick. You need to get help. It's not that it's your fault or that I'm blaming people that have depression. The idea is that you can't say there's nothing wrong with having depression. It's like saying there's nothing wrong with having cancer. You wouldn't be ashamed of to have bronchitis or something. Yeah, see? So, ah. Uh, there's no reason to be ashamed if it's your brain that's sick instead. You spend a few more Minutes talking with Alec about your therapy and your feelings about it. He's incredibly supportive because it's easy to be supportive online. Uh, and you're happy to find that you have a confidant that understands your illness. And is willing to lend an ear when you're having nights like this. A little while later you fall back into bed, kitten in tow and find it easier to drift off to sleep even in therapy you know you're still gonna have nights like this sometimes it's good to know you have a friend who will help carry you through them it's a chilly Thursday night and you've just gotten off work this has felt like one of the longest days you've faced in recent memory even though nothing exceptionally bad happened a ton of minor things kept going wrong and co-workers had tried your patience throughout the day. You considered leaving work early, but the last thing you wanted to do was deal with your insufferable boss on top of everything else. You're lost in thought on the commute home, and your feelings of frustration both with your life and the world around you build as you run into minor annoyances, like someone bumping into you really hard as they walk by. By the time you get home you're exhausted and remember that these feelings were once you identified as a negative feedback loop with your therapist. These pent up feelings aren't dying down You are, and are eating at you. You open your front door and stare at your apartment. An overwhelming feeling of exhaustion overcomes you and you feel like your energy levels are low enough that you likely settle into a single activity tonight. What do you do? 
uh, what does distract yourself mean? Because you can reach out to someone close to you or you can distract yourself. <sighs> By distract yourself, they imply masturbation. It would be a good idea, but if not, we're going to reach out to someone close to us. Your head feels too noisy and you need to trade it for some actual conversation. Your therapist did say that it was important to reach out to your support network, so you might as well give it a shot. Who do you call? Okay, so... Uh, your mother is a fucking bitch. Malcolm is a good choice. But Alex is the person that's closest to you. You know, she's a short walk away from your house. As if I remember correctly. And you're sort of intimate with her. So she sort of is the only one that deserves to be in the loop on your therapy and shit. We're going to go with Alex. But if we call Alex and find out that she's currently choking on somebody else's genitalia, we're ready for suicide. What should we do? On the other hand, I would love to know if she's choking on somebody else's genitalia, so... You know Alex, who picks up after only two rings. You ask if she has time to talk and she tells you she's just hanging around in her PJs and is actually somewhat bored for once due to being caught up on her coursework. You try to figure out where to start with how you're feeling and are overcome with missing her face. You asked if she feels like grabbing some dinner and you notice her barely contain surprise and delight on the other end of the line. Yeah, she, she basically is trying to drag you out all the time to see you. And... Yeah, of course she wants to go out. You meet about half an hour later at an inexpensive diner not far from your apartment while the food is not great. You're surprised by how much your mood seems to have elevated just being in her company. Normal. While at first you were extremely hesitant to talk about your job situation for fear of being burdensome or something like a whiner. So, we know the main character. I don't know if whiner can be used if you're a woman. And I realized that there was an attempt to make the main character gender neutral, in a sense. Because, you know, why not? And I'm not sure whiner could be used as a woman, you know? And the character is definitely written as a female character, you know. They tried to make it gender neutral. They didn't make a... It, it isn't horribly obvious that the character is female, but as a male, I can't really relate. Maybe it's the entire idea of being, you know, probably depressed. Maybe that's what's throwing me off. But... No! No, actually. You see her listening in intently to you with what even to you seems to be genuine concern. After winding down with a beer, you cautiously open up a little bit more about your feelings surrounding your job and how drained it leaves you feeling. How you feel like you're simply existing selling days of your life for no real purpose. You surprise even yourself when you start talking about how frustrated and stunned you feel by your job. 
about how you used to feel passionately about things but feel like all your energy and capacity for creativity is getting leached out of you each and every workday. You can remember how long it's been since you've externalized this much raw emotion. The two of you spent several hours in the diner booth long after your half eaten food was cleared and the waitress stopped refilling your coffee cups. As you get up to leave, a sudden wave of self-consciousness washes over you and you suddenly feel incredibly awkward. Then Alex stands up and grabs you tightly around your waist. You realize that short of boring her with your seemingly endless rants, she's simply happy to have gotten a chance to spend time, real time, with you. Yeah, because that's the illusion, right? That's what... That's what women think when they say, Oh, you need to be in touch with your emotion. Oh, no. No. That's not what men do. No. We... We're not big on sharing and all that. So... We do share, but... This is not the typical behavior. And I'm not sure their relationship, that they're that intimate for if you know, we grant that this is a male character. I'm not sure they're that intimate for him to open up like that. And even when a man opens up, it's more like we have a problem, I can't function. And it's not, well, I feel like... You know, it's not about the feelings, it's about the function, so, I don't know. <laughs> Spend real time with you. It's been, by all accounts, incredibly too long since you've allowed yourself to open up to them like this. And there's an almost palpable feeling of closeness you allow yourself to hold on to as you go to bed that night. Why am I still depressed? Interaction is exhausting and you're becoming more and more withdrawn. No, I'm not. I just shared my feelings with my significant other. This text right here, you're depressed and rest is bullshit. We have made progress, game. <laughs>